people here. Um, I'm going to ask Shane to warm us up here. Shane, stuff is moving like a river right now in your world. I can only imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, uh, it, it's been uh, a crazy couple of days. So the last couple of days um, have, have been good where rates have kind of calmed down. But we saw earlier in the week that it was very tough to get, get um, people that didn't have perfect credit a rate with no points. Um, renovation loan programs have been dropping like flies, uh, everyone. So if, if your customer is looking at a fixer upper, the, the renovation loan programs will not be in abundance right now. They're just looked at as kind of a higher risk program because it, you know, somebody closes in 60 days and then they do work to their property and then the home is done in maybe three to six months from now. Well, when unemployment increases and the economy slows down a bit, uh, mortgage investors get worried about, okay, will that builder be in business three months from now? And will that mm -hmm. customer have their job three to six months from now? So, so renovation loan programs have been dropping uh, big time. I, I'm, I'm hearing from my competitors and colleagues at other companies that they're, they're suspending them uh, not eliminating them, but suspending them for the time being until things get better. So that's something to keep in mind. On the on the good side, in the last two weeks, the last nine business days, um, I've gotten um, six property inspection waivers um, on new loans that we've taken in that we don't have to do an appraisal on. Um, and most of the time they are with larger down payments. So really, it, the, the numbers continue to grow with that, which is really making it much easier as far as the appraiser and the seller really not wanting, you know, to be around each other, you know? So, so when you say larger down payments, what are we talking about? Yeah, over, or I'm, I'm seeing it, it, you don't get a property inspection waiver unless they're putting 20% down. Okay. So, um, so if, if someone's putting 20% down or more and they're not buying the biggest house in town, there's a chance that we won't need to walk in the home to do an appraisal and that's a that's a tweak and an adjustment that's just started over the last week and a half. Yeah. Now let me ask you a question. Um, one of the things I had heard on one of the calls was that you may have to uh, submit for an appraisal, but then they can change their mind and, and waive it off at some point. Or how does that work? Yeah, yeah. If the seller pushes back, um, and uh, and that might be a tactic. Uh, if you have a now, if you have an appraisal that you think is going to come in. Uh, uh, you know, strong, and uh, you don't need that newly renovated kitchen inside to to get hit the value. That might be a tactic that I've had. I think one or two of those where the seller really doesn't want the appraiser to come in their home. Maybe someone is sick and not feeling well, uh, and and they've just said, "Okay, I, I can do this without it." And uh, they they get our okay, and we we haven't said no yet from what I've seen. So. Um, that that's something that that could happen. The appraiser is still going to do his work, and the customer is still going to be charged for that, right? Uh, the buyer is still going to be charged. Where the difference is with a property inspection waiver, buyer doesn't pay for it. They don't. They save five hundred bucks. All right, good stuff. Who else has some questions for Shane while we have him here? No questions. Well, I'm around if you guys need me. Feel free to call me or or email me if you need me. All right, Shane, as always, we appreciate you, man. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Hal. <clears throat> All right, guys. So how is everybody? This is week three-ish, right? Have I lost track of the days? Has anybody else lost track of the days, or is it just me? <laughs> I don't think I know what day it is anymore, or time. Yeah, there's all kinds of memes out there, snarky memes trying to tell you what day it is, right? Um, so here's what we're going to talk about today. Today, we are going to talk about what do you know, lead generation. And um, before I get into a screen share um, and, and have some slides and some, some things I want to share with you, because what I do want to talk to you about is just basically some, some, uh, some, some strategy on lead gen and how important it is to have a pipeline and really to work a lead pipeline. We're going to talk about that today. Um, and, and I'm happy to see that Chris is on here because I'm actually going to go into my command account and try to, to go through things a little bit. And it's always good to have a wingman who can tell me all the things that I'm doing wrong. Um, oh but what I want to show you is, is, is how to, to, once you've got leads, really how to work that pipeline a little bit. But before I even do that, I want to take a step back right now because I think um, lead generation has changed dramatically in the past uh, two to three weeks. So would anybody agree with me on that? 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think everything has changed dramatically. And um, it's going to be different for the foreseeable future. Um, I was just talking to my wife, uh, who works for a, a big agency, and uh, they were told not to expect to be able to get back into their office until the end of May. Um, and so trying to work from home. So we're looking 60, 90 days possibly here. Who knows, right? We don't know. But what we do know is what we were doing up until now isn't what we can do any longer. And, and, and even when markets change, when markets shift, you've heard me say before, and I'll, and I'll say it again, the basic fundamentals of business don't change, right? The way we do things do have to change. But the bottom line is that, that we are in a lead generation business, right? And so one of the things that I'm hearing, and I just want to just have a quick discussion before we get into this, is I am starting to hear from some folks that they feel with all the upset that's out there in the universe, with all of the uh, 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 sort of drama and sickness and all that, that focusing on generating leads right now is poor form. I've heard people say that it's inappropriate or it's, it's inappropriate for us to be out doing lead generation when there's people who are sick. And, and I want to put that conversation out on the table for a minute and just talk about that a little bit. Is there, and this is not right or wrong, but I think it's something that we have to, to kind of wrestle with. Is there anybody on this group call right now that is, that is feeling at some levels that that's something they're dealing with? Trying to figure out how to do that. Okay. Um, I'm going to unmute you to the extent I can here, hopefully. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, Try to unmute you guys here. What's the what's the the you know what's the thought that's going behind there, in terms of the fact that maybe we shouldn't be doing lead gen right now? Anybody? I thought I unmuted y'all. Maybe I muted y'all. No, you muted us all. <laughs> no, I I'm, muted. I have to say I've been um I've been doing more lead gen now than I ever have before, and um. It's different. I'm not, it's not the, the same script that I was using before, but I'm reaching out to people, um, seeing how they're doing, what I can do for them personally. And then I always say like, you know, it's a really scary time right now. If you have anybody looking, um, that was looking to buy or sell and is really confused during this time, please let them know that I could be a resource for them. I have two listings coming on and I closed one last week and I have one closing next week. So yeah. people that were afraid that it can't happen right now, I can talk to them and tell them that it can. Yeah, you know, Patty, that's exactly, that's exactly the approach. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that happens is anytime we go into this kind of a, a mode here, and again, this, this uh, sort of work shift, work stoppage in some ways feels like I've said more a little 9-11-ish than 2008-ish. It's something that happened and it just seemed to happen really, really fast, right? And one of the things that happens is when, when the world turns upside down that quickly, we all kind of go into shock for a little bit. And, and in that shock phase, I think a lot of us really do have to, you know, hunker down. We focus on ourselves. We focus on our families. We make sure that everybody's safe and everybody's taken care of and healthy. But then I think what happens is after a, a short period of time, a week, two weeks, three weeks, maybe, then it starts to shift into something else. And, and one of the things that we just have to remember is one of the things that has not changed is that the reason why people need to buy or sell real estate is because typically of a life cycle event. They've had a baby, maybe somebody has died, maybe, you know, who knows what, but there's some kind of a life cycle event that happened irregardless of whether or not COVID-19 is out there. And so one of the things that really is important is, A, we have to keep checking up on our folks. The lead generation right now for the past couple of weeks has been, you know, take care of your people, right? reach out to people, check in on them, see how they're doing. And one of the things that naturally happens is once you start to ask people how they're doing, they're gonna to start to ask you how you're doing. And, and that's just the law of reciprocity. And what's beginning to happen as the agents that I'm talking to is these, these conversations about real estate needs are starting to materialize sort of naturally on their own, right? Because the need hasn't changed. But I also think that as we start to move forward for the next 30 days, 60 days, is we, we've got to, to learn how to be comfortable recognizing that despite all that's going on out there, there is still people who need to buy or sell or rent or lease. And how do we provide solutions for them, right? How do we provide solutions? And so if you have any drunk monkeys out there that are saying right now that's bad form, that that's inappropriate, 
I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to kind of take a good look at that, right? Because what we are is we're problem solvers, right? We're out there trying to solve the problems that people have. And right now, people got a lot of them, right? And some of the things, the challenges that they have, the need to buy or sell a home hasn't changed. And if we can find a sensitive way to kind of have those conversations that isn't tone deaf, you know, I, I, I uh, go back to listening to uh, one of Al Donahue's calls, which I have to be mindful of the time because he's going to come up at three o'clock. Um, and just a couple of days ago, and he had Stacy Esser on. Anybody, quick show of hands, anybody see Stacy on that call? Stacy out of the Tenafly Market Center is one of the real pros out there, right? Exactly. And one of the things that she talked about in terms of how to introduce awkward or difficult conversations is just a linguistic technique that we, that we call framing. And it's, it's starting the conversation by saying, you know, this may not be right for you, but, you know, this may not, and it usually comes out of a, a call like we're making right now, the check-in calls, how are people doing? And once we've established that people are fine, the conversation moves into, you know, this may not be right for you right now in your life, but a lot of folks out there still do have the need to buy or sell a home. And, and, uh, and we have solutions out there to make that happen still. You know, is that something that you, is a need for you or if not, who do you know, that kind of a thing. So this may not be right for you, but is a way of kind of framing that linguistically so that they can push back and say, you know what, that's not right for me, as opposed to saying, hey, I can't believe you brought that up. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to share my screen. I want to try to share my screen and I'm getting better at it, but you know, it's sometimes easier than others. If I share my screen and I go to my PowerPoint here, y'all see this? Yes. Okay, cool. So far, so good. Now I'm going to try to see if I can move this over. And the slideshow from the beginning, if I do it well, slideshow from the start. Here we go. So make lead generation the core of your business. One of the things I shared with you on Tuesday, if you were on my, my call on Tuesday, was this comes out of Gary Keller. Uh, having conversations with his top agents that he coaches and they really started to chronicle what are the things that successful agents do every day. And we break those down into two camps, right? Agents work on growing their business and they work on running the business. And on the growing your business side, it comes down to four tasks. It's lead generate for buyers and sellers, make listing presentations and get listings, make buyer presentations and get listings. Oh, and by the way, a buyer listing would be a signed buyer's agency agreement. Um, and then we preview real estate. That's what we do to grow your business, right? And on the other side, running your business is all those other logistical things, marketing, showing, negotiating contracts, transaction management. We're going to focus today on the lead generation side, right? And, and um, here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to show you a model. Everything that we do in this company is built on, on systems and models and proven models. Anybody have any ideas why we're so models focused in this company? Is everybody still muted? No. No. Anybody have any ideas why we're so models focused? Oops, didn't mean to do that. Well, here's the answer. Because people have lived before us, right? We don't have to figure out the universe every time. People have lived before us and success leaves clues. And so one of the things that we do is we study the people that succeed at the highest levels. And we try to take a look at how do they do it? And there's a model for lead generation that I want to share with you. It's broken into kind of three phases. The first phase is the lead generation phase. The second phase is the database management phase. And then the third phase is sort of the lead and the sales pipeline phase. So, so let's unpack each one of these for a second if I can. Let's see if I can do it. Here's the lead gen model. You all see that? Okay. Uh -huh. Right up here on the top in the very first section. And let's scoot ahead for a second. Uh, let's start right here. The lead generation model starts at the top here and it breaks down into two things. What do we have as lead generation? Two key elements. And what are they? Prospecting and marketing. Prospecting and marketing. One of the things that happens so many times when I talk to agents about lead generation and why the phrase lead generation sometimes gives people the willies is because there's a lot of folks who hear lead generation and automatically they believe that that means cold calling automatically they believe that that means calling people that you don't know and sort of nagging them or harangue, haranguing them. And that is not lead generation or it's not lead generation at its highest form. Lead generation has two elements to it. It's prospecting and marketing and it's designed to get into a relationship with people. 
And, and we're not going to do a super, super deep dive on all the ins and outs of prospecting and marketing. If you want to do some of that, the Lead Gen 36123 course is running on 10 o'clock in the morning. Tomorrow morning at 10, from 10 to 12, we're going to do a deeper dive on sort of thinking about prospecting and marketing. But talk to me about how you guys see the differences and similarities between the two. What's the difference between prospecting and difference between marketing? Marketing is consistent. Say that again, whoever that was. I do marketing consistently. Okay, but how is it differently than prospecting? Because I want you to do both of them consistently. All right, aren't they intertwined? They're different tasks. They're, they're, they're different tasks. And what we like to say is lead generation is prospecting based, but marketing enhanced. And so if you start to think about sort of what are the differences kind of between the two, think about it this way. Marketing is a little bit more passive. Marketing is more attracting. Marketing is getting your brand out there, your value proposition out there, getting people familiar with who you are so that they reach out to you. Okay, now who's seen some examples of, of real estate marketing out there, of people that are using a variety of different channels to get themselves known so that people will reach out to them? Anybody see some examples of that out there? Sure. Supermarkets. Supermarket shopping cart. What else? I do it on a local website. Local website. Terrific. What else? Cards and letters all the time. Cards and letters, direct mail. I can't drive yeah. anywhere on the New Jersey Turnpike without being see, seeing Big Rob's head on the billboard, right? <laughs> I mean, that man is everywhere. And I'm starting to see people trying to trying to hack him a little bit. I'm starting to see Michael Sells NJ websites and all that billboards. But here's the thing. Marketing is, 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 is there's a cost to it, typically. There's more dollars invested in it, Right. And it's designed to attract people to you. And it also has another really important feature. It also sort of um, prepares the soil, if you will, for your prospecting efforts. I use the analogy of gardening. And you can spend a lot of money on, on flowers and plants and put plants in. But if the ground is not prepared, if you don't have the right soil composition and if you don't have the right pH balance in that soil, those plants aren't going to thrive. Marketing, in many ways, is what are we doing to prepare the soil? How do we get ourselves known in our target communities through all different channels so that when we show up actively prospecting, people know who we are and people have some recognition of who we are. And the benefit of doing that is it triggers what we call the similarity bias. It triggers something that we call the mere exposure effect. If you were to Google the phrase mere exposure effect, what you would find is, it, is a social psychology phenomenon where the more people are exposed to something, the more they become familiar with it. And, the, and over time, they actually begin to develop preferences for the thing that they see more often. And when it comes to people, there's also something called the proximity effect, which says, if it's a person who is local to me and I see them again and again and again, I will begin to feel as if I have a relationship with them and take preference to that person over someone else. So, if all we're doing is prospecting, if all we're doing is the active, and I'll use this definition of prospecting, think about the old time gold rush. The, the prospector sitting on the side of the stream with his pan in the, in, the, in the river, getting a lot of mud, sorting through a lot of mud to see if he can find a gold nugget. A prospector is getting his hands dirty, right? He's out there working it. But if we're not doing the marketing first, if we're not setting up the environment where when people show up, when we, when we show up as a prospector, people feel like they know us and they're already somewhat familiar with us, it's going to be hard. It's gonna be harder than it needs to be. So, so one of the things from a lead generation standpoint is don't forget the marketing side. Now, what we said is it's prospecting based. Most of what we do should be actively getting out there and talking to people and building relationships. But if we're doing that and we're not doing the marketing in advance of it, if we're not doing the marketing in, con in conjunction with it, this prospecting is not going to flourish to the extent that it could. Give me some, give me some thoughts around that. I, I can't see the whole room right now, but give me some thoughts of, of, of feedback around that thought. Because I hear a lot of people say the marketing isn't lead generation. Marketing is marketing and lead generation is prospecting. That is not true. 
They are both leisure. I have a question. Go ahead. So your marketing and your spending, I mean, I've spent 27 years of marketing and wasting money with nobody telling me, well, maybe you shouldn't be doing that. It's not working. If it's not working, why well, keep doing the same thing over and over again? I've sent out thousands upon thousands of postcards and have never gotten a response in return. Um, I did, however, send a letter to my community and it was in an envelope mm -hmm. and that envelope got me a listing. Mm -hmm. That listing just closed. But that was the first time that I got a response from any of the marketing materials that I've ever done. So one of the things I think you have to be real clear about in your strategy, Susan, is what is my goal here? Because if your goal is to prepare the soil, you're not, and to make your prospecting efforts more successful, the way you're going to measure that is not necessarily because people responded to your marketing piece. The way you're going to measure that is when you prospect and convert that lead through your prospecting and you have a conversation with them, they're going to let you know that they've already seen your marketing pieces. And the question is, how am I going to measure that, right? Because I do think one of the things we have to do as business people is we have to measure what's working and what's not working. And now more than ever, it's time to pull the plug on things that aren't working. The shift tactic number four and remarginating your expenses really is going back and looking at all your lead sources and seeing where they've come from and pull the plug on expenses that aren't part of that answer, right? The ones that aren't generating leads, we've got to pull the plug on. But the thing we're gonna start with is prospecting is active, marketing is a little bit more passive, but they both have to work in conjunction. And the idea is it's designed to capture that person for them to raise their hand. In the Keller Williams command language, we're defining leads and contacts differently than many of us have done previously. What we're talking about as a lead is somebody that we have, um, have a one-way communication going with. And I, what I mean by that is maybe it's somebody who, filled out a web form on your website. Maybe it's somebody who signed into your open house. Maybe it's somebody who filled out a, uh, a lead capture form in your Facebook social media advertising and you've got them now. You've captured their contact information, but you're not really engaged in a two-way communication yet, right? And once we do engage in a two-way communication, then we're going to call them in the new KW language a contact, right? This is somebody who now we're going to start to nurture in a different way. So here's the, 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 again, the overview of the two. Marketing is money intensive, it's passive. It doesn't necessarily get out there and touch someone the way that prospecting does. Whereas prospecting is more time intensive, not money. It's more proactive, not passive. And it leads to more immediate results. And I'm here to tell you that if you do your prospecting in an area where you're already doing your marketing, it leads to immediate and more consistent results, right? Now, um, I am looking for a slide here, just to, I'm jumping around a little bit here. When we've got leads, when we've got that one-way contact in our KW command databases, right? What we have to do is think about how are we gonna, how are we gonna uh, kind of work that relationship? How are we gonna build a, a rapport with them? For folks who are leads right now, it's a one-way communication. What we're recommending is 19 touches a year. We call it the 19 to connect. And we're going to do that through smart plans. And I'm not going to go through smart plans today. I know that Chris can do a way better job than I can. And he's already done it many times. And those, those videos are out there on, on our BCP pages. right? But, but when we get somebody who comes into our database, into our command database, what we want to do is until we've turned them into a two-way conversation, we want to stay in front of them. And here's the 19-touch model of what it kind of looks like. You know, 12 touches or once a month would be something like a monthly newsletter or a monthly email or a monthly market report. Can anyone think of a smart plan that exists out there that is designed to be delivered once a month that is already stocked right off the shelf in the KW smart plan library? The, the neighborhood update. The neighborhood update once a month, if you've attached the neighborhood, right? And once a month, it's going to send them an, an update in terms of what's going on in their neighborhood. Everyone who's a lead who has not yet turned into a two-way conversation should be at least on that neighborhood nurture update. And then that's 12 of our 19. What else? How about 
quarterly touches that are phone calls. Is there a quarterly telephone call smart plan that's there? Say yes. If you're, if you're not aware of that, then the answer is yes, there is. In your command smart plans, you're gonna find that there's a quarterly uh, contact and it's just a reminder once every three months to pick up the phone. And if all you do is once every month pick up the phone and get their answering machine and say, hey, it's Hal from Keller Williams Realty. I'm just reaching out to you again to see how things are doing. Uh, if you have any needs out there, I just want to let you know I'm around and leave that message. And then three months later, come back again. But that is, if we don't have the two-way conversation yet going, we're still going to leave those messages. Is, um, is Kim Julevic on this call? She's not. Okay. If you were on Al's call yesterday, Kim got featured a little bit because one of the things that she's done is she's taken, I believe, three listings in the past week or in the past 10 days, maybe. And those listings were not listings that were generated necessarily in the past two weeks time. Those were people that she's been following and following and following over the last year. And many of the touches that she's made as I've talked to her about them or she's talked about them, many of those touches were just leaving those messages. Hey, it's Kim again. I just want to let you know I'm out there thinking about you. And then what's happened now is in the past week or so, as she's made her checking in on you nurture calls, those, those calls now have turned into opportunities for her because people's need to sell their home didn't change just because there was a pandemic. And she was the one who was consistently in this 19 touch plan staying in touch, right? So it's a neighborhood nurture once a month, um, the neighborhood plan. It's four telephone calls. You might have two touches, which might be a direct mail, or maybe you're going to send out a magnet or don't send magnets, but do, you know, just some sort of promotional thing, right? And then once a month, maybe invite them to an event. The point is 19 times to connect. And once people have connected, then we're going to put them on a 36 to convert, right? 36 to convert. And again, this is going to be a combination of smart plans. I don't want to get too deep into the smart plans right now, but you see the logic in terms of how the model works. We do prospecting and marketing to capture them into our database. We do a 19 touch over a course of a year to stay in relationship with them until they become a two-way conversation. And once they become a two-way conversation, then we put them on a 36 touch in order to nurture that deeper, right? That's the top of the funnel lead generation model in a nutshell. Give me some questions, thoughts, concerns, questions, jokes, anything you want. Talk to me about that model. Does it make sense? Heidi, did you have a question? You were asking if you can be unmuted. Okay, I don't see the chat box. So who is that? Uh, Heidi. Heidi, can you unmute? She said she wasn't able to. All right, let me see if I can unmute you. Hold on for a second. I just found the chat box. Uh, Heidi, let's see. Are you unmuted, Heidi? Heidi, are you unmuted? Doing my best to unmute you. I don't know if I can unmute you either. Yeah, I don't know. Can you type your question into the chat box, Heidi? Maybe we'll do it that way. No, I just unmuted, but I don't have a question now. All right. like you answered it. It was right. a wrap. Okay, terrific. Well, it's always good to hear your voice. So, <laughs> All right, so that's the first part of the model, right? Is, let me go back a smidge here. The first part of the model is prospecting marketing to capture these leads. And once we've captured them, we're going to call them a lead if they're people that we're not having a two-way conversation with and a contact if we are. If we're doing a one-way communication, we're going to go with this 19 to connect. If we're staying in touch, now it's a 36 touch, okay? Now, that said, I'm going to skip along here. I want to, want to just kind of move to the next part of the funnel here. The next uh, thing that we want to do is we want to, uh, as we're adding people into our database, right? As we're building our database, the first people that we want to be adding in are, for starters, the people that we already know, the people that we already have two-way relationships with. And when we start lead generating, you know, lead generating with the people that you already know and you have a relationship with is, is going to be a much higher return than trying to lead generate for strangers, right? Um, and so the first group of folks that should go into your database is everybody that you already have a two-way rapport with, right? And who would that be? That would be friends. That would be family. That would be colleagues from previous jobs. That would be people that you know from the gym or from church or from the club or wherever you know people. 
everyone goes in to your database, right? Everyone goes in and somebody once said to me, well, what happens if there's a person who I have a two-way relationship with, but they don't live in New Jersey, there's no way that I could ever possibly do a real estate transaction with them. What do you think my answer to them was? Referral. Very good. There is still an opportunity to be of service to them by helping them to find a, a great local agent in their own market. So the first group that goes in, in your lead generation plan are your contacts, people that you have two-way relationships. And then come your leads, right? Then are people that you only have a one-way relationship with, people that maybe you've met at open houses, people that maybe you've met at a networking event, people that maybe you know because you can get their information from the tax record and you know that they live in your target area or on your street, you're not really communicating with them consistently yet, but you know how to reach them, they go in next, right? And the leads get the 19 touch plan and the contacts get the 36 touch plan, smart plans, right? Make sense? Questions around that? And again, to do a deeper dive on how to do these smart plans, I'm going to bring you back. Chris, where are you parking those videos? Are they on the BCP page or somewhere else? Chris Gareffa, are you unmuted? No, you're not unmuted either. Let me try to unmute everybody. All participants are unmuted. Yeah, um, so we have them in multiple places now. We have a, um, a log of the videos on our Bergen County Partners Facebook group. And then where? we also have a YouTube channel as well. Can you, somebody said where, can you unpack where that would be, how, where they would find those videos on the page? The Bergen County Partners Facebook group. I'll link it in the chat box. Okay. And, then, and I believe when you get yeah. to that group, Chris, on the left-hand uh, margin, is there a button there? that says videos? There is, yep. Yeah, and that's where they all live. It's like going to the library. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Terrific. Okay. So here's the thing, once we capture leads, you know, one of the things that we've got to understand is that just having a database that has names in it doesn't really lead to much, right? If it's just a Rolodex, if it's just a list of names and contact information and email addresses and stuff, it's not gonna necessarily do much for you. What we have to do is we've got to work these databases and we've got to cultivate them. And, um, one of the things I'm going to ask you to start to think about is when someone has given you the idea that they're intentional about the need to buy or sell real estate, they're going to be treated differently than somebody who, who is in your database and doesn't have any particular need. That makes sense, right? And the way that we treat them differently in the old school model was that we had what we called a, 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 a lead pipeline. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how that pipeline carries through now into a command environment. But when you think about a pipeline, what does a pipeline do? Where have we heard the phrase pipeline before? Anybody? You never heard the phrase pipeline before? Am I teaching a new word today? Connection. No. Connection. Okay. Let me, let me do it this way. If I said we had a transcontinental oil pipeline, what does that do? It brings oil, oil from oil. one place to another. It brings oil from one place to another. And so what it implies is movement. Am I correct? It's a transportation vehicle. Yes. It's a way that guides the transportation from one place to the next place. And so one of the things that we've got to start thinking about in our lead generation is as we're capturing leads, and we're in our language calling leads people that we have a one-way conversation with and turning them into contacts in our language now we're saying people that we have a two-way conversation with inside that world are people that have the need to buy sell or invest in real estate and in the kw universe now we're going to call those opportunities there's an opportunity to do business okay and the thing that i think everyone has to decide for themselves in their own business is at what level of intention, at what level of, of desire does somebody move from just being a contact in your database to a contact where there's an opportunity? And, and I think it's a time frame question. How close to taking action would someone need to be for you to begin to follow them differently as an opportunity? 
Has anybody thought that through for their own businesses about what those timelines look like for them? I think it depends on what you get from them. I spoke to somebody yesterday and he said, I'm not going to be ready to look at houses again until the summer. So I'm going to touch base with him regularly just so that he knows what's going on. But, and if I find anything that I think looks good before then, I'm certainly going to send it to him. But so yeah. he's still an opportunity for you, correct, Heidi? Yeah. But now but that's we're going to talk a little same. bit about classifying hot, cold, and medium and all those different things. He might have gone down in temperature, but he's still an opportunity, which you oh, agree? Yeah. yeah, for sure. At what point, though, would somebody not be an opportunity in your world anymore? If they said, I'm looking to sell my house when I retire, but I don't retire for four more years. Is that person an opportunity in your world yet? I guess so. Yeah. Yep. Four years out. Everyone gets to decide this for themselves. Yes. And I'm going to tell you that the deciding factor for a lot of agents is how busy are you? If you're really, really busy and you're working a really active business, you may not necessarily follow somebody who's four years out the same way that you would follow somebody who's in a shorter time frame. For me, the, the, the cut line was one year. When I was actively selling, the thought that I had was that if you were going to buy, sell, or invest, and I believed that you were intentional about it within a year's time, I was going to track you differently, right? Now, I've heard some other agents who are running bigger enterprises that say they're, they're so busy that if you are not prepared to take action within six months, you're not an opportunity yet for them. I heard Gary Keller one time from the stage at, at Family Reunion say that if you're not prepared to do business in 14 days, you're not an opportunity for him. Yay for Gary. <laughs> That's a pretty tight window for a lot of us, right? But the thing you've got to decide for yourself and your own business is at what point am I going to consider you an opportunity? And I'm going to try to change this up if I can. I'm not sure if I can here. So stick with me for a second. I'm going to try to change my screen share to a point here where I can get into my command dashboard. Everybody see my dashboard here? Mm -hmm. Did you know my mom and Amy Harold? I only get called Harold in real trouble, which is far too often, but that's another question. So here's the <laughs> thing. We've got our contacts in here, right? And, and I don't have a lot of contacts. I'm not in production. Most of my contacts are test contacts, but here's my contacts, right? And I put a couple in here and it's loading slowly. I got double A buyer and I got double A seller. And I do have my buddy, Dick Dillingham in here. I don't know if you know him. He's one of the great KW coaches of all time. He actually was the Dean of the Keller Williams University at some point. Here's what opportunities look like. And Chris, jump in and, and, and kind of correct me anytime I'm saying anything that doesn't sound accurate. But the thought that I want to have is when you're nurturing folks in your smart plans and you're having conversations and somebody's starting to give you the inkling that they are intentional about buying or selling real estate within a time frame. For me, it would be a year. I'm going to go to my opportunities tab here and I'm going to create an opportunity. And what I have to decide is, are they a buyer opportunity or are they a listing opportunity? And we even have lease opportunities down here, right? And let's just say that I was talking to my friend, Double A Seller. And what Double A uh, Seller said to me was, you know, um, we've been uh, talking about um, really uh, in retirement, selling this house and, and moving to a house up at the lake. And uh, we're going to do that when my wife retires and she's planning on retiring. Uh, at the end of the summer. To me, that's an opportunity. It's within the time frame that makes sense. If they said by the end of the year, to me, that's still an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go over here. We're going to create an opportunity, right? And we're going to talk about how to move this through the pipeline here now. We're going to create an opportunity and I'm going to just pick the Ridgewood Market Center. This is a listing opportunity. We're going to pick the client. And who did I say it was? It was double A seller. So I'm going to start with double A and there's double A seller. We're going to pick that seller. Now, a couple of things we've got to do here is we have to make some decisions about, you know, what phase of this opportunity is it? Well, we're nowhere near an appointment yet with double A seller. This is a cultivate. We're going to stay in touch. We're going to cultivate. What's the stage here? And there's a couple of different stages. Chris, can we edit these at all? Or are these the only stages we get? I don't know if I, maybe I've muted Chris. 
anyway, this Chris, if you can unmute yourself somehow, that'd be great. If you're not, don't worry about it. The stages that are in here are watch and or nurture and or hot. Okay. Chris said you should unmute him. I would if I could figure out how to do it. I got so many windows open here. Chris, I'm mm -hmm. going to unmute you. Chris Gareffa says you're unmuted on my screen. Are you? Now he is. I'm good. Okay. But I don't know. That's weird. It's not letting me. Um, it wasn't letting me unmute myself. But uh, um, yeah, with the stages, you could actually create your own. And you can customize it however you do your business. Um, so I know some agents now who are actually going in and, and essentially customizing those stages. And it doesn't have to even be just three. It can be however many stages you need for that particular phase of the transaction. Um, in this case, cultivations is when you're, you know, first starting to work with a lead. You know, um, the way I, again, the way I like to think about it is, is really in terms of what I perceive to be their timeline to take action. To me, somebody who would be a hot lead, to me would probably be somebody who's really ready to go within 30 days, right? Mm -hmm. And then nurture is kind of a squishy one. It's okay, longer than 30 days, but how far out would that be? You know, does it go 30 days to 60 days? Uh, does it go 30 days to six months? These are all business decisions that you need to make, right? Um, my practice when I was selling is up until about six months, I was going to treat you in nurture-like fashion. And then six months to a year, I was going to treat you in what we call watch fashion, where I was going to stay in touch, but I wasn't necessarily um, staying quite as close as, as I would if you were within six month window. But we're gonna decide here in command, we're gonna, this is double A seller, we're gonna cultivate because he said that he's not ready to sell until the end of the summer or until the end of the year. He's gonna become a watch. We do have to put a commission in there. And because uh, I really think I'm worth it, I'm gonna put down 10% because that's just how I roll. And wow. we're gonna put in create. <laughs> okay. Now here's the deal guys. Now we've created this opportunity here right? You guys have seen some of this before. Here's the thing that's really important, and this is where the rubber hits the road. When we go into our opportunities, right? And let me just go back out for a second here. I want to go back out here to, this is the list view here, right? So here's my opportunities. Now you see AA seller is here. Mm -hmm. One of the most important things that we have to keep in mind in terms of pipeline management is it, 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 a pipeline is about movement. It's about flow. It's about motion. If we have a pipeline that isn't moving, what we have is a pond. What we have is a, is, is a reservoir. And when things don't move, when water doesn't move, what happens to it? Stagnant. It, 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 it gets algae. It gets, yeah. it gets gross, right? And so the only way we can keep people moving through our pipeline is we have to get them to commit to take action, right? Now you've heard the phrase always be closing. I'm not talking about closing here always because closing is something that happens at, the, at a very precise time in the sales cycle. But every interaction that we have with AA seller from the time we put him as a cultivate, every interaction should, lay, should leave with what is the next step I'm gonna ask you to take. And so how are we gonna do that? We're gonna do that by going into our AA seller, and I'm going to propose that you do it right here in the notes. So I've talked to AA seller, and AA seller has told me that thinking about selling the house when the wife retires at the end of the year, what would be a reasonable next step action that I might be able to get AA seller to take to keep moving forward towards that step of listing the home? Is it time to have a listing appointment? Not yet. No. Too early, right? We don't need a listing appointment yet. But what would make sense 10 months or 12 months out? That would be something that they might be willing to do, which would still be in line with taking action towards getting ready to take a listing. What would they be willing to do, do you think? Take an inventory of everything in their house. Okay. And what would be the intent of that? To decide what they want to take with them and what they can start selling. All right. Terrific. So... If I, and who was that that was saying that? Cindy. Cindy, okay. So Cindy, if I'm talking to the AA seller and he's saying, hey, I'm thinking about selling my house at the end of the next year and we have a conversation and we say, well, you know what? Maybe the thing to be doing right now is just kind of going through your house 
and deciding what would you take with you, what would you not take with you, and uh, start to take inventory. Of what are things that you need to get rid of, right? Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yep. And so, so if AA sellers said, hey, that's not a crazy idea, right? There's certain things I'm willing to do. There's certain things I'm not willing to do. The thing that I'm going to tell you that you're going to get the most resistance on in any type of sales is when you ask people to commit their time to meet with you. Giving up their time to meet with you is the, is the biggest commitment you can ask of anyone. And so this isn't the time for us to get together, but lower the bar. What would you be willing to do? And so I'm just going to go right in here. I'm going to go into notes. And I'm going to write a note to double A sellers thing. And the note is what? The note should always be in my mind, next step. Next step. Next step. And I might even put the date, next step, April 2nd, 2020. And what are we going to say? What did we commit that double A seller was going to do? Go through the house and start Go to take a list of what they were going to keep and what they were going to. So inventory. Yeah. The uh, home for items to sell. Well, how are we going to call that? I don't care. We're going to call that and we're going to save the note. Because now what's going to happen is I'm going to come into my opportunities. And as I work my pipeline, I'm going to start with my cultivates. And I'm going to look at all my cultivates, all the people. And right now it's only one. Guys, as this starts to fill up, what I've started to see is as you're cultivating more people, this particular view can sometimes be, uh, the board view can be a little cluttered. Sometimes the list view is a little easier to see. Right now I've only got one. But as I'm working my pipeline on a regular basis, I'm going to go to my cultivates. I'm going to click on each one and I'm going to go to the notes and I'm going to see what's the next thing mm -hmm. that they committed to do to move the ball forward and in my next follow-up with them, what are we going to talk about? Anybody? See how far they've come with that inventory? Hey, how did that go? The last time yeah. we talked to you, you said you're going to walk through the house, take a look mm -hmm. at stuff. How's that going? Is there anything else that I can help you with on that? If sure. they don't commit to do that, if they said, you know what, Cindy, uh, I just haven't gone around to it yet. What kind of information does that give you? Does it give you any information about motivation? Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe it's, hey, maybe they're not as motivated as I thought they were. Maybe it was, you know what, um, I had all intention to do that, but then this wacky COVID-19 came and I'm just so preoccupied with other things that that's the least thing in my mind. It's not motivation, it's distraction. Yeah. But the point of the matter is, the thing that we have to be doing in our databases as we're nurturing our leads along is we've got to be connecting people from call to call to call to what was the next thing that you committed to do? How's that going? Is there anything else that I can help you with on that? If they did finish that task and said, you know what? I've actually started to go through it. I've got this whole list. I'm keeping this stuff. I'm getting rid of that stuff. Terrific. What's the next step that would make sense that you would ask for? Yeah. And it doesn't matter what it is really, right? Maybe the next step is, do you know how to get rid of that stuff? Have you ever sold stuff on the yeah. Facebook marketplace? Have you ever done whatever? It doesn't matter. But yeah. then what are we going to do? We're going to write another note. The next note is going to be written with the current date. Mm -hmm. Next step. Now it might be May 2nd because we're a month later. And the note is going to say, provided information about how to sell things on the Facebook marketplace and encouraged him to kind of get that process started. And then when we're making our next cultivation call, what are we going to lead with? Hey, how did how, that go? How successful was it? How was that? Right. The thing that's going to separate, you know, getting leads into the funnel and moving them through. I go back to that image of the funnel, right? If you saw that model, it was shaped like a V, like a funnel. What happens in a funnel? You put water to the top and the weight of the water pulls it through. The, what's going to pull your leads through the funnel is the commitment to the next step. Make, preparing them. Mm -hmm. Preparing and just every single time you're on the phone talking to someone, what's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? Because as you do that, that's what we call pipeline velocity. As you do that, our pipelines are becoming live. They're becoming vibrant. They're moving, they're flowing. This is not a real estate skill. This is a sales skill. And I can tell you that there's people in sales professions 
everywhere. I come out of healthcare. I spent a lot of time dealing with, with drug reps and, and vendors who were in sales, selling all kinds of durable medical equipment, all kinds of things. And there's all kinds of sales people that believe that they've got a huge database of leads and they believe that that lead database is going to just lead to revenue for that. And the truth of the matter is a lot of folks, what they have is, like I said, they have a cesspool. They've got a bunch of names, but they're stagnant. They're not flowing. They're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. What we need to be doing once we get our leads into our funnel and we've made the determination that they've earned the right to be moved into the opportunity phase is we've got to do this next step note, the next step note, the next step note, every single one. Now, hey, Bill, I have a quick tip for you as well. Go ahead, Chris. Um, if we actually go back into the, the sales pipeline again, and if we click on that listing opportunity, so the cultivation, do you see on the right side where it has that little zero of zero? Mm -hmm. If you click that. Let me see, where are we looking, Chris? Uh, right on the seller, AA seller listing card. It says zero of zero, uh -huh. click that. So that's actually a checklist. And you can actually add items to that checklist. And that can be another way to kind of keep track of different tasks that have to essentially happen before this moves. Yeah, and that's a really good thing too. And what you're going to probably start to have as you get deeper into the process, you're going to have checklists of things that happen in a certain sequence. But in the early phase of pipeline management, in the watch phase and in the cultivation phase, it really has to be uh, something that you create in real time because it's going to be born in the conversations that you're having in real time right? Once we move through and we get people to a more active place, and now we're going to start the series of steps to go out there and do the pre-listing and start to do the photography, all that stuff, then these kinds of checklists are really, really awesome. What I want to make sure that we're doing is, is in our conversations, we're connecting every conversation with an anticipation of where the next conversation is going so mm -hmm. that these keep flowing, right? That's the trick. That's the nature of pipeline management. And this tool is really second to none out there in the CRM universe in terms of making that work, right? So if we go back, see if I can go back here. One of the things I'm starting to learn how to do marginally well in Zoom, and I say marginally well, because that's really generous, is um, when you're hosting meetings, there's, there's sometimes so many windows open that you can't figure out how to get back to where you want to get back to. But I'm going to go back to the uh, PowerPoint here. And see if I can move that slideshow from current slide, right? Managing your database. I'm just gonna go back up here and moving people through this funnel. Stick with me, I'm gonna to try to find the right image. Here it is. As you're moving people into the sales pipeline and cultivating them, you're gonna be nurturing them, right? Mm -hmm. Through that next step, you know, commitments. And then once we get to a certain threshold, now we start to get into the process of the appointment and now it's an active listing and now it's an under contract and all that stuff. So this is really how we're gonna nurture leads in the early phases, in the watch phase and the cultivate phase, right? And what I will tell you is if you master this skill, what I have seen through the years, I've coached hundreds of agents through the years. And one of the things that I've seen through the years is, the, is that most of us get enough leads. Most of us capture enough leads. Most of us connect with enough people between the open houses that we do and the networking that we do and our own sphere of influence. We get enough people into the top of the funnel. The reason why so many of us struggle is because we don't consistently move them through, mm -hmm. right? Is that people climb out of the funnel because their timeline that we're not staying in, in touch consistently so that the moment that they need us, we pop back up again, scrolling back up to this, page here, we're going to do 19 touches for the one-way conversations when they climb in our funnel. If I did an open house virtually or in real life, and I had somebody show up, every single person shows up, goes into my 19 Connect, whether they've committed to work with me yet or not, unless they have committed to work with someone else, and I recognize that I, I want to be hands-off, everybody goes into the 19 touch in my, in my pipeline. Because what you're trying to do is just trying to stay in their lives and earn the right that when they're ready to take action, they take it with you. That's what Kim did at such a high level this week with her three listings. Those were born a year ago, some of those, right? But she stayed in touch. Once we are in touch, 
36 to convert. The moment somebody starts to give you an inclination that they need to buy, sell, or invest in a time frame that makes sense for your business model, for me, it was a year, for you, it may be longer or less. Now they become opportunities and we get that commitment to next step and we move them through. If we do it this way, people don't fall out of the bucket, right? If we do it this way, we have a, a much better chance of converting. So I wanna keep uh, honoring Al's time. It's four minutes to three. And I know a lot of us wanna be on that, that, that call. Um, I'm gonna try to make sure everybody's unmuted. Who can give me some feedback or some thoughts about what we've been talking about for the past hour? Good information. I'm sorry? Good information. Good information, okay. What would you do differently? Uh -huh. are all about, you know, what, is, what have you learned? What are you thinking differently about? And what would you act differently on? For 25 years, I've been marketing consistently. I've been doing direct marketing and keeping in touch with clients from 1994. And it's worked out. They, they you know, consistency it. is everything. It right? is. Yeah. They appreciate it. Yeah. And I think it was Susan earlier was saying that she had done direct marketing for a number of years. I tracked it. I think she mentioned she didn't know if she had gotten response. Whenever I sent out a mailing, I would contact them and say, hey, what did you think about what I sent you? And they would give me great feedback. You know, that's the prospecting and, and marketing enhanced. Every marketing piece that you send out gives you an opportunity to call people and say, hey, did you get it? What do you think about it? Right? And they love it. I had a client call me. I sent him Dunkin' Donuts um, gift card a couple of years ago. I sent it to everybody with their anniversary cards. My one client in Franklin Lakes called me up and said, oh my God, that was brilliant. <laughs> and it was really inexpensive, wasn't it? It was like a $5 gift card and you were brilliant. Yeah. Um, one other thing real fast, and then we'll get one or two more ahas in the time we have. It, when we're talking about tracking those uh, lead sources, there is a place, Chris, right, to capture lead source in command. As you're meeting people and they're moving over from lead to contact, as they're moving over from the one-way communication to the two-way, if you don't know where you met them, meaning I met them at an open house and I put them in myself, or I met them at an open house and I had the, the uh, landing page that Chris showed me how to build, pull them right into command for me, right? If I don't know what that lead source was, the moment they switch over to connect, that's the moment that we start to ask. And we track that lead source because I do not want you throwing good money after lead sources that aren't paying off, especially now. Give me another aha and then we'll call it quits for today. One last one. I know there's 20 odd, some odd people on here. I guess everybody's still muted. How do you like that? Mm -hmm. All right, guys, here's what we're going to do. It is, uh, according to my watch, it is 2.59. We're going to end this meeting. I'm going to ask you to jump on Al's call. He's always got important, timely information. I want you to get that. I hope there's some value in this conversation. We'll continue it moving next week. If you do want to do a deeper dive, though, on, on um, prospecting and marketing, that class on lead gen will be tomorrow morning at 10. And look for the links in your, uh, your office's emails for those. Okay? Thank you for everything. All right, guys. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Al. Thank you. Be well. Take care.